I hope that that all of you got to read about Soraya Shamali's multiple awards um, for her work in expanding the power and participation of women in civic and political life, and that you you read about her wide media coverage and watched her TED Talks. And if for some inexplicable reason, you do not have at least two copies of her book, then you want to make sure that you um, that you inform your local bookstore about that. Uh, so I just want to say uh, just a few words about uh, just it in as an introduction. Um, in the recent and not so recent past, our guests in this community, uh, these community gatherings, were surgeons specializing in endometriosis, reproductive endocrinologists. Uh, we had a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner, some time ago, we actually had a holistic pediatrician. Soraya Shamali is the very first guest who is not directly engaged in the field of reproductive health. And yet, for me, her work is more urgently needed than any of the above. Why? Why are the ideas in this book so crucial for us to engage with? Because the modalities I listed and the remedies they offer, whether synthetic stimulants or herbs or acupuncture needles or nutritional supplements, they're all well-regarded tools of repair in the world of childbearing difficulties. They pose no real threat to the status quo in the context of this challenge known as infertility. But in spite of a growing number of studies in epigenetics, psychology, the relatively new science of uh, the re relatively new field of neuroscience, the idea that anger can affect our hormones in good and bad ways, that it can have a profound effect on the possibility of a viable pregnancy, that our view of anger is reflected in our relationship with our partners and our doctors, and most importantly, in our view of ourselves is still poorly understood. And since the power of anger as a fertility modifier is poorly understood, it is marginalized not only by our healthcare providers, but by us, which is not something we wanna beat ourselves up about but it is something we want to become more aware of. And that's exactly what I hope we get to do here together. Celebrate anger as perhaps the most untapped fertility boosting resource in every sense of that word. So um, now I'm ready to, uh, to invite Soraya to join me here. Uh, let's see, uh, let me just change my view so that I can see you a little more. Just um, fill the speaker view here, good. Yeah, so that was my little introduction, and now we're ready to dive in. And I think I'd like to um, welcome, just, yes, yeah, just want to say thank you so much for accepting 
Oh my, my gosh, I'm so honored to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, as a writer, you know, sometimes you, you think about things, you study them, you say these things and it goes out into the world and you really don't know what's going to happen to your words and thinking. And I very, very much appreciate um, not just your reading it, but um, really thinking about it and understanding um, the, the way it might be valuable, you know? And so thank you. Thank you all for having me here today. Um, I think what I what I'd like to I'd like to start on a personal note. Um, one of the one of the things that that comes up a lot in 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 this world in in my work is the idea that um, as painful as a fertility challenge is, it's also an immense opportunity to heal something in our family line. And reading and rereading your book, I realized how much of that healing of our, of our maternal lineage is linked to the way our mothers, our grandmothers, our great-grandmothers experienced anger. And, um, and I just wonder if, if, if you can touch on how... How how has that become true for you? How has your relationship to anger made you a healer in your family? And you know, I know it wasn't wasn't an easy road. Yes. Well, you know, and I, I think some people in my family might contradict you. <laughs> I don't know that they necessarily all feel that I'm a healer. Um, a healer. But but I do. I do think like for, uh, I can only speak from my immediate own experience, which led me to write the book, which was that I grew up in quite a traditional Catholic um, conventional family and learned very early on to put aside my feelings, particularly feelings that were thought of as negative or demanding or selfish all of which anger, particularly in women, is categorized as, um, and not to demonstrate those feelings, but also given no tools to understand what those feelings might mean. And so well into my adulthood, um, I would say I was probably in my mid 40s when I realized how much pain I was suffering physically and mm -hmm. how much anguish and um, how much damage was actually being done to my relationships mm -hmm. because I really didn't understand my own feelings. And so, and, and two, I think this is true regardless of your own family, religious or, or childhood context. If you have grown up as a girl in most societies, there's a lot of shame and self judgment associated with the feeling of anger. And so in the book, I trace this genealogy of anger in my own life. How did I learn this? What was my mother like? What was her mother like? What was my father like? You know, what were their relate? What was, how did they relate to one another? Um, and, and I do go back to my great grandmother because in fact, Anger is this very essential, important signal emotion. And when we feel it, it's because we know that there's something wrong in the world around us. There's a threat to our safety or our dignity or our well being or our future. There, you know, there, there are many different ways to um, in, interpret what anger is telling you, but in almost all of them, it is saying there's something wrong, something has to change. Now, it, very often it's the case, particularly starting in early childhood, that we will look at a, a child who is a girl child or even a, a boy who is feminine and attribute to them sadness instead of anger. Because we're much more comfortable with a sad woman than an angry woman. We'll also pathologize what they are expressing and say, oh, there's something wrong with that person, particularly in adolescence. 
a, a, you know, an angry adolescent girl, of course there must be something wrong with her. Or depending on where you are in the world, what you look like, your race and your ethnicity, we will criminalize that anger, we will discipline it. So in the United States, if you are a young black girl, you don't even have to be angry, right? You might be assertive. You might display um, aggressive behavior that's rewarded in boys for being rambunctious. But if you're in school, you might be, you know, in, in some places, a young black girl starting in kindergarten, three to five times more likely to be suspended, expelled, or disciplined for acting in ways that are um, highly tolerated in boys. And so there's all these messages we get and one of the things we learn to do is not just suppress the anger or divert the anger, um, but to stop being able to understand what it feels like in our own bodies. Do we feel flushed? Do we have racing hearts? Um, and some of that I will say, and I do think this is relevant to your prior guests and to the medical establishment, some of what we learn is just part of modernity and dualism and a culture that says you have a mind and you have a body and your mind is stronger than your body also highly gendered right because we live in these weaker bodies theoretically which is to me really just laughable but we live in these weaker bodies and our minds are supposed to strive for the rationality of people who are masculine or men and all of this becomes a really snarly mess Yes. Um, yes. And causes a lot of stress that we don't have words for. Um, and so that is the context for my writing the book. And in the book, I have the genealogy to try and provide a narrative of what it may look like to think about these things. But I start in childhood and go through adolescence, what I call the theoretically fertile years when you know, if you are a woman and you're at work, whether you can have a child, want a child or not, you're, you're still subject to the, to the societal norms that expect you to or are demanding that you do. And then on through menopause and old age. Yeah, so there's a lot here. Um, and um, I, I just wanna um, just, just kind of take us a little bit back to, back to your, your grandmother and your great grandmother, because I, you know, I, I feel practically related to your grandmother. We're related by name. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, I think everybody has to fall in love with her if they, they read about her. And what I found so interesting uh, is that how, how, uh, her, how her relationship to anger was so different from your grand grandmother. I think her name was Zarife. Yes, Zarife. Zarife. Yes. And um, and how, as you put it, you know, uh, Zarife. Uh, where is that note that I had? Um, that 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 Zarife kind of personified um, the the. What, what suppression of anger can do to our bodies. Yes, and actually I think that needs to be coupled with just the unspoken traumas that we live through and that go unrecognized and even imposed by society, right? It's not just that her anger became material in her body as it does in all of our bodies, but that she was so violently oppressed that she literally became mute. Yeah. You know, she was 14, she was kidnapped, she was theoretically married by my great grandfather, she had seven children in five years. And, and, you know, by the time she was 50, she literally didn't speak, right. you know, and everybody just dismissed her as a raving madwoman. But in fact, when she was able to leave her home, and travel somewhere else, she began to speak. She, she was in a hospital. She asked for knitting needles. I mean, she wasn't catatonic. And so, you know, the juxtaposition of these things. The, um, the environment, you mean, how, how, much, how much the culture and the environment that we're in. 
Well, and you know, these things, this is, I think the point for every family, it's very complicated, right? Because first of all, all families at some point, I, I have a huge family, I have like 30, 40 first cousins, right? Like my family's sprawling, but you know, we have a lot of intimate partner violence. In the United States, there are exceedingly high rates of incest that we won't talk about. And so in these very intimate settings, um, things are not good in a, in a lot of homes. And yet to come forward and say anything is a huge risk for mm -hmm. people who are suffering from violence. Um, and I mean, what happened to my great grandmother happened you know, 80 years ago, but in fact, over the course of their lifetimes, my grandfather was loved and adored and he was funny and, you know, people admired him and he, and he led his life freely, you know, but my grandmother who was assaulted and traumatized and essentially in many ways, she was sort of enslaved because she was taken from one place, mm -hmm. carried across the planet to a place she didn't know, couldn't speak the language and, and pregnant for years on end. Um, and isolated, and yet that was supposed to be normal and actually was supposed to be good for her because a man had taken her. Yeah. I mean, this is what we're talking about in you know, 1917. Um, so I think context is everything. Yeah, and it's, it's, a, it's also kind of fascinating to me that, that you were able to talk about this as a as a child that you could see this in spite of the fact that the that your family did not consider I, I mean this is where i say it's not necessarily welcome i mean my family created a fairy tale right they literally created a fairy tale in which my grandmother when she was 14 or 15 was you know walking in her city and a handsome man on a horse this was the story, rode up, swept her off her feet, carried her off, and here we all were. And it sounded like a Disney movie, you know? And so the first time I heard it, maybe I was five, I thought, wow, that's like a princess story. But by the time I was 11, I had already experienced a fair amount of street harassment. I understood what the threat of rape was. And so when I heard the story again, it didn't sound quite so romantic. So I... I said that and I, you know, and I thought, well, did she know the man? What, you know, what about her family? Did she go back to her family? Like I just started asking questions and, and my family's response was just to sort of laugh and pat me on the head, you know, like what a funny thing to say, of course. And then I got a little older and I was like, you know, my great grandfather, that guy, he's not a good guy, but everybody loved him. You know, and so how can you feel safe in your own home or in your own family if you have this level of fantasy going on? Yeah, and I mean, that's what, that, that, you know, that's, I, I go back to that because that's what so many of the women that I work with struggle with, you know, that, um, that they have to come to a place where they can hear that voice inside them that knows the truth, but has never been validated. Yes, and I will be honest for me, reading feminist history, feminist theory, I started that as a very young person. That enabled me not to feel alone and isolated with my thoughts or with my doubts and to, to cultivate an intellectual framework for how to maybe develop a different perspective than the one that I was given. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, you know, every one of us has the experience of knowing when something feels deeply uncomfortable and wrong. Yes. We have these instincts, we have anger for a reason, you know, they, 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 they didn't like fall out of the sky on humans. We evolved to have these feelings to, to help ourselves and to and, and to navigate dangerous situations or threatening situations. And so, you know, I, I think probably what made a difference to me as a young person was that I, I had, despite all of the convention and traditional 
very patriarchal norms of my family, I understood deeply that I had an unconditional love from my parents. I never, ever was scared that someone would hit me. You know, I mean, I just never had that fear. I, 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 it was a gift. I fought, really fought with my dad, but I fought with him and he listened to me. He didn't agree with me. He'd get very angry at me, but I never felt that I could, he would hurt me. And I think that that's comparatively rare, to yeah. be honest. Mm. Yeah. Um, so I want to, and, and, you, and I touched on it in the introduction, and, and you also touched on it already. Uh, but if we could just say a little more about this idea of, of, of the cost of severing anger from feminine. Yes and and how it impacts our bodies it's very clear it became very clear to me both personally and my own experiences with the medical establishment with childbirth um with scientific studies with research i, I mean i immersed myself for several years in in studying this subject and there's no doubt in my mind and i, I I don't know how to say this clearly in a simple simple way, but there's no doubt in my mind that our emotions are manifest in our bodies. And one of the issues I personally struggled with is that I grew up in an enlightened, post-enlightenment world, right? I grew up with a Cartesian approach to life. We all have, like if, if we grew up with Western educations, in particular, that's how we learned to think. And there's a not just a, a, a duality, but often an oppositional binary in almost anything that we approach, any problem. And there's also a hierarchy to that. So whether it's male, female, white, black, rational, rational and emotional, I mean, there's an endless list of these binaries. And so one of the issues for women is that as feminine people, emotion is attributed to us, particularly irrationally, irrationality. And um, that's attributed to us and it's supposed to be the realm of our purview. Our power comes from our emotional regulation, not just of ourselves, but of our families, our spouses, our children, if we have them. Like we're supposed to be like magic emotional creatures, right? And um, Yet emotionality is weaponized against us because emotion, emotions will never be as important or as valuable or as high status or as um, regarded as rational thought, which is embodied by a certain type of uh, maleness and men. Um, and I think that's a pretty fair framework for how our education approaches things, but also for how the medical establishment approaches them. And in fact, all of that is, is inflected by racism, right? So in fact, if you are an angry woman and you are of European descent, your anger is more likely to be categorized as craziness. If you're Hispanic or kind of ambiguously dusky like I am, you're kind of hot, spicy, you know, much more likely to be sexualized. If you're black, you're definitely just this unhinged threat, an angry black woman, the threat of that person, right? And um, if you are Asian, you're much more likely to be just expected to be passive and sad. And that affects all of our interactions. So think about an emergency room. There are these studies, um, several from different countries all over the world that show that um, in emergency rooms, women generally will wait anywhere from 15 to 45 minutes longer to be taken care of because people expect women to forbear and put others first and to be quiet. If a woman gets angry, instead of responding to her, if she demands help, she's actually penalized by being made to wait longer. Mm -hmm. Whereas a man, as particularly a white man, for example, in the United States, will get help immediately because his anger confirms people's expectations of his identity, which is that he has more status or power or leadership and that the emotion confirms all of that and that the rest of society should go along. And so the social construction 
of not just, it's not just about how we may be feeling internally. People think feelings are internal things, but in fact, the emotion is a communication tool. It's socially constructed. It's how we relate to each other, the, the, the way we articulate these things or respond to other people's articulating of these things. Within, within fertility, like some of the other things that I talk about in a chapter on embodiment, um, there are often very high rates of suppressed anger. And we see that with anxiety, with depression, with breast cancer, particularly in black women, there's, there's uh, been an interesting study on that. Um, and so I don't see how it's um, legitimate to try and treat people without acknowledging, we don't understand it well. I don't wanna say that there's a causation that's, yeah. that it's clear, but it's definitely a factor that we need to be thinking about. You know, I always have to, I always have to qualify, you know, when I talk about this and we have this little chant in, in our fertile heart community, you know, yes. never, 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 never blame yourself. No. Because why not? Because you would be giving yourself too much credit, you know? It's <laughs> right. You're not, uh, this is not, does not happen, did not happen in a, in a vacuum. We're all part of a culture that, that we grow up in. And, you know, in, there's something in the in the infertility world. This um, this power structure is it, the power struggle is further complicated because the reason it's it's so complicated is because because the the medical technology is truly miraculous. So when it delivers, we are grateful and and uh and it takes we're not so willing to also speak about what we have witnessed and uh, and 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 we actually don't want to hear that the the deep patriarchal uh influence of of what's happening to us you know how it erodes our self-esteem how it it negates our history, how it reduces us to a hormone level and right. age. And so it really takes, um, it, I, I, to me, it's, it's, uh, it, it takes just a, a great deal of awareness and, and, um, and uh, you speak about compassion compassion anger i'm not sure was it compassion and rage or passionate compa anger compassionate anger and and i think we that's something that that we need to bring into this 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 world as well so that even when our children show up are we going to speak about what we have witnessed how deeply patriarchal that world is well it's hard it's hard right i mean i want to go back to your question before because i didn't adequately answer it i wrote about i i wanted to ask the question why do we sever this emotion from femininity which happens very early on that's pretty clear right because we we understand all the biases we understand that anger in women makes people uncomfortable regardless of how they may inflect it um, but that it buttresses men's leadership and power, right? That's true at home, it's true in corporate settings, it's true in medical settings. And so if it's such an important emotion, if it helps us in self-defense, if it makes a demand, and this is important, anger will, it's, it's a really social emotion. It makes demands of others and we are not supposed to do that, right? This is the thing about shame because Men might act in anger and they will report feeling guilt. They maybe did something that they thought they shouldn't do. But a lot of women who report anger also report shame, which means there's something wrong. They feel there's, there's something wrong with them. It's not something that they maybe did that they wish they hadn't done, but that to feel angry, especially on their own behalf, makes them feel like bad people. Mm -hmm. And so, how are we supposed to defend ourselves? whether we're in a conversation with a spouse or we're going into a voting booth, if we are not allowed to acknowledge threats to our well-being as legitimate and worthy of societal care. And so the first society that we live in is our families. If we cannot express anger in our families, 
do we actually have reciprocal relationships? Do we have caring relationships? Do we have real intimacy? If you have a partner and you can't say, I'm very angry because of X, what does that mean? Because in fact, your anger is an expression of a deep hurt or need. And I'm not talking about the unhinged rage of destroying things, you know, taking a sledgehammer to a wall. By the time you've gotten to that rage, it's already dysfunctional. I yeah. just mean the feeling of hurt or indignity or sadness. And what happens to many women, particularly women in hetero relationships, is that they learn to express fear and sadness instead of anger, because it puts men at ease. Mm. They, they will cry. We, a lot of us cry. I cry when I'm angry because I really think I learned not to use my words, but to kind of demonstrate a traditional feminine mode of distress mm. that would then maybe elicit a more sympathetic response in the people around me. Because for me to be angry or aggressive, which I don't, you, you know, you can be aggressive without being angry would, would result in punishment, literally, you know? And so um, I just think it's important for us to recognize that our anger, as Audre Lorde said, is filled with knowledge. We have it for a reason. We should respect ourselves. And in fact, we should demand reciprocal care. This is the source of so much anger in women. It's not, it's not that they're scared. Someone's going to get mad at them and yell at them or hit them it's that they'll be mocked and that nothing will happen and what that says to us is I am doing all this caring but in fact can I ask people to care back and will they because it's hard to realize they won't yeah yeah I'm, I'm so glad that you mentioned the the sledgehammer yeah, I know you talk about that also in the book the the anger rooms because yeah. I do some clients who say, oh, I, you know, I got rid of it. I went to the anger yeah. room and, uh, and actually I don't, I agree with you. I don't think that is the more, the more meaningful way to engage uh, with anger. There's one, one uh, point that I just cheered when I read this in your book. And here's, here's why I cheered. Um, last night in one of the groups that I teach, we talked about um, how the full name of, of my program. See, so first it was just Fertile Heart. And the full name, um, it didn't, did, was not born until like 10 years into teaching. And what completed it is this letter V. Um, you know, I talked about the orphan that engages with anger from this place of powerlessness and, and suffering and, and, and feeling victimized and the ultimate mother who is, you know, divine and knows, you know, wisdom and all that. But I didn't, this wasn't born yet. And, um, and we were talking about it last night and, you know, how, how is, how is, a visionary, what does that mean that we are called to be visionaries um, on, this, on this parenting journey? And then I got to page 262 in this wonderful book called Rage Becomes Us. And it said, uh, anger is a moral emotion. And to me, a fertility crisis it's not just a health crisis, not just a life crisis, but it's a, not not just a, a, a you know a, a life challenge, but it's a moral challenge. So to read that in your book was tell us more. Why is anger a moral emotion? Well, I mean, uh there's a, I think there's a lot that can go into that answer, which is why I really spent some time with it, right? But at the most basic level, every person has a sense of what is right and what is wrong. And that sense of what is right and what is wrong shapes our relationships with others, but it also shapes our self-identity. And so, this emotion in particular is like a guide. 
it's a guide for those that thinking. And again, we deny children emotional competence, boys too, right? Like the same way that we might punish girls for speaking loudly and forcefully, or we'll, we'll kind of trivialize them by saying that they're passionate about something and, 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 you know, make fun of their hobby or, you know, we do that with boys. If they express anxiety or sadness, if they demonstrate traditionally feminine traits. And so we gender these emotions for no good reason, other than it supports a sex segregated ideology, right? We gender it and we leave ourselves disarmed. We, we don't, for the most part, I mean, no one ever talked to me about anger my entire life. It wasn't like as a parent, I was equipped to talk to my children about how to interpret their feelings or emotions. It was only through lack that I realized I really needed to be able to do that with my children. Um, and, and, and actually I write about the mistakes I made when I realized I wasn't doing it. I was just repeating the things that I had learned and I was angry. I was like, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? You know? And so I, I think that's very important. I want to mention this because I don't want to forget this. Um, in the book, I started writing a whole chapter on care, the care mandate, the idea that if you're a woman, if you're feminine, if you're, you know, if this is your role, well, this is our role. If we care, we're not supposed to break relationships. We're supposed to make relationships and keep relationships and tend to those relationships. But we learn that anger breaks relationships, threatens relationships, and it's very conflicting. How can you fulfill your role in life if you are actually acting in a way that undermines that core essence of who you're supposed to be? And the chapter got so long and sprawling and ugly, I, I just, it just it never ended, that I then split it. And I made a second chapter, which was about motherhood, not being a mother, because I think this is very important to infertility. Um, and, and to conversations and, and, and situations of infertility. Just the idea that from, in your very essence and being, you are supposed to be a mother, regardless of whether you want to be, can be, will thrive or not, will be physically injured. I mean, they're, they're like, it's just, and look at what this country is going through, right? Compulsory pregnancy. This, this is just an insanity, in fact. But by the same token, it's very hard to escape the societal press. And I think, and, and I have had not personally, but quite intimate relations with people who have struggled with infertility, it can become very hard and really enraging to tease out the societal norms the family pressure, the intimate demands and relationships from what you yourself feel. And how are you supposed to even know what you feel? I, I you know, that's a, that's, that's. Yeah, that's absolutely, yeah. that's very much. I just worked with a client recently who after, uh, and she might be there if she's, if she's on, I'll wave to her. After four years of struggle, you know, she, she is coming to a place where she's not sure whether whether this is what what she needs to do right now is to get become pregnant. And so I make it very clear that my work is not about uh, not about pregnancy. It's that's a side effect if pregnancy is possible. My my work is really about turning this this crisis into into a, a journey of prof profound healing, which. It can become precisely because it is so emotionally challenged, uh, right. so emotionally charged. So it's it's so everything is amplified, and yes. everything is amplified. That means that also deeper healing is possible. So, so. Can I ask? Can I ask you a question? And I hope this isn't an insensitive question, but I have had a lot of conversations with people who've experienced pregnancy loss. Um, or even women who have children and regret having their children. And in fact, I think, I think that because of the way we approach problems, 
those groups of people are siloed and it becomes extremely difficult to have conversations across those experiences. And yet I think there is something extremely valuable about conversations across those experiences. That's exactly what we're doing in our circles. We're having, it's, it's open. We're having conversations about, do I really want it? Uh, I, I don't think I've come across uh, anyone who, who regretted being a parent. Uh, and, and in some way, uh, I think that, that it has to do with the fact that we do so much and such deep work in preparation for pregnancy that I have yet to come across a client who will write to me 10 years later, you yes. know, this is a, this is, well, a, I think this is a, probably a different situation. Yeah. Yes. And, and, and even, you know, I, I really feel, uh, and I see it more and more uh, as I read about postpartum is that this work kind of preempts postpartum because all of the things yes. that come up for us uh, postpartum are really the, the pain and the wounding uh, that we haven't attended to right. uh, in preparation for pregnancy. So in, in a moment, uh, I, I think let's open the chat and maybe see if there are any questions, but I just want to complete this section. So if we have a replay, we have it kind of nice and neat. Uh, and so for that, I'm going to read... Um, I'm going to read a very short note from um, from one of the moms. A note that I got last night, actually, and um, it was uh, it was written as a as an assignment. One of the assignments um, suggested assignments I give to people is to write a letter to that part of us that feels victimized from the from that visionary that's being born and this is this this note is so much about what we're talking about that i i want to read it it's very short <clears throat> so she is so this is a letter from the visionary mother newly born visionary mother to the to the orphan uh, and she says you do not have to be calm or rational or quiet you can be hysterical angry out of control, you can be so fearful, you are shaking and crying uncontrollably, you can be screaming, you can be sobbing, bawling, gasping, you can cry or wail or fume when you need to. You can go on doing this for as long as you need. I will hold space for you always, no matter what. I know you are here to remind me of what we lived through together, of how unfair it was, how difficult. You are never alone. You are loved and cherished and adored always. I will hold you all through the long dark night until the sun rises each morning. And while I will repeat this every night, you are safe and sound in my arms. I am strong. I'm a strong devoted parent and I'm here for you always. Thank you for all that you are teaching me, your mama. I just love this. You know, I think that that's that's what we're doing, right? When we talk about healing our relationship with anger, or or anything, or any other quote unquote negative emotion. I'm I'm on a mission to actually delete that word negative. I I agree with you. You know, I I I think that that's really. I mean, it's very clear too. I think that if if you are able to recognize and label all of your emotions genuinely say oh it's uh, this can I, I mean I have had this problem where two years after something happens I'll say to myself oh wow I was so angry I didn't realize how angry I was because I didn't want to admit it or I didn't want to feel it but it took me that long you know but if if you can understand your emotions generally speaking you will enjoy greater peacefulness creativity, happiness, you know, trying to manage these negative emotions because we've been told that it makes us bad people to feel them or express them has to like 
it's just not good. It's not healthy for us. It's not healthy for the people around us. Um, it's definitely not healthy for our society, right? I mean, it's a downright authoritarian way to try and regulate intimate relationships, right? I wonder and, where those where, where does all that anger go? You know, when we when we say that we're not supposed to feel it, right? right. Yeah. So I um I'm, I'm I'm with you on that. You know, the minute we say something negative, it's negative. Where it implies that we're not supposed to feel it, right? Yeah, but I will say this: our concerns are completely legitimate, right? It's not that oh, we're imagining something bad might happen. It is that we have the experience of being fought against, denied, mocked people, you know, and, and what happens is, you know, I'm, I'm gonna put this in the context again of a hetero relationship because this is so striking to me. It's very different from a lesbian relationship or a gay male relationship or relationship between non-binary people. Um, in a hetero relationship, there, there are several studies, they're not a lot, but there's several studies that show that in fact, when a woman expresses that she is angry, men don't listen to what she's saying makes her angry. They get angry at her for being angry because they perceive her anger to be selfish. Mm. And so they never get to the point where they're listening to what, their spouse is saying is so upsetting because they're so busy being angry that she's expressing this emotion. Now, in a in a in a personal relationship, if you're the woman, you're not going to turn around and say, "Oh, you don't like that I'm infr infringing on your masculine privilege." You get to do that, and if I do it, it's somehow a threat to your identity. That's just not the way intimate conversations tend to go, right? Right? But in fact, those identities pervade heterosexual relationships because heterosexual relationships, particularly within the context of marriage, are factories of gender stereotypes. Without even wanting to, people fall into patterns of gendered behavior. Yeah. And that becomes an extremely enraging um, baseline Dynamics. for a lot of people. Yeah. Well, we call it we we call it in this community, uh, Soraya. We call it orphan to orphan uh, communication, as opposed to ex exactly what you're saying, as opposed to you know visionary to visionary right. communication where we get to hear each other. So, can you can you do this? Uh, I know I asked you uh, a, ahead of time if yes. you would do me a do us. Uh, a favor or a or if we can enjoy this together uh, as we celebrate anger so the second paragraph on on page 296 if you could read this to us as we wrap up this part of our of our session thank sure. you yes yes of course in the coming years we will hear again that anger is destructive Watch carefully because not everyone is asked to do this in equal measure. Women especially will be told to set our anger aside in favor of a kinder, gentler approach to change. This is a false juxtaposition. Re-envisioned, anger can be the most feminine of virtues, compassionate, fierce, wise, and powerful. The women I admire most, those who have looked to themselves and the limitations and adversities that come with our bodies and the expectations that also come with them, all have found ways to transform their anger into meaningful change. In them, anger has moved from debilitation to liberation. Angry women burn brighter than the sun. I just love that line, I love it. I just wanna say thank you. And um, I think that what you're doing as a community is very important. and really wonderful. I know it isn't easy. Um, and, and I certainly don't want to show up and, and make it sound like I'm saying, just get mad, everything will get better. I, that's not what I'm saying at all. Um, but I do think that um, the paths that lead us to this point are just very complex. Um, and so any tools that 
we have at our disposal, we should we should try and cultivate. Um, I think for now, if if you have, I know that there are more questions, and I I'm happy to engage with you through email. Um, I'm happy to um, you know maybe do another call because people are asking you know how specifically this can um, support your fertility journey. And not that long ago, I did a 75 minute workshop on specific tools uh, that we use in the fertile heart practice work with anger. And that workshop is now available for free. Um, all you have to, all you, you can just go on, on our website. And uh, what did I call it? I called it fertile rage. Um, anger as um anger as healer yeah fertile rage anger as healer on the scenic road to motherhood also known as infertility and you can download it and really very specific tools on how to turn anger into a fertility drug so we can continue this conversation uh, i i look forward to also continuing learning from Soraya, the more I read your book, Soraya, the more, the deeper I go with the subject. So let's just say that we'll continue this conversation one way or another. And thank you again, Soraya. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Wave to each other and to be continued. Okay. okay. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for having me.